darkest days of the American uh, Revolution, after the Continental Army had experienced several defeats, a farmer who lived near General George Washington's camp decided to pay the soldiers a visit. You know, he said, I'm going to go see what's happening. And as he approached the camp, he overheard a voice raised in agonizing prayer. On closer inspection, he saw General George Washington down on his knees in the snow, tears streaming down his cheeks, asking God for assistance and guidance. The farmer crept away and returned home. And when he went home, he said to his family, it's going to be all right. We're going to win. The wife said, what makes you think that? Well, said the farmer, I heard General Washington pray out in the woods today. Such fervent prayer I've never heard. And God will surely hear and answer that kind of prayer. That's what he said. Because there was such fervency in his prayer. Sometimes, you know, uh, we don't hear, we, we hear a lot of superficial prayers, but somebody was pouring out his heart because his heart is so burdened. He says, we're surely going to win because God's going to hear that. Such was the prayer of a man we're going to look at this morning. And he's known for a very short prayer that he prayed. He, not for anything else he did, but for a prayer. <laughs> if you were to turn to the first nine chapters of the book of First Chronicles, you'll buy, your Bible will show you, uh, you'll find a list of genealogies containing more than 500 names. These names make up the official family tree uh, you know, of the Hebrew uh, tribes, beginning with Adam and continuing to Israel's return from captivity all the way. Most names are mentioned with no comment. You, you don't see anything about these names. You just name them, the name that the name that the name. You know, but there's someone mentioned in chapter 4 who stands out above the crowd. His name is Jabez. And he's not particularly remembered for what he did, but for, for what he prayed. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. You understand what it is saying about his name? His name, his mother named him Jabez, because that name in Hebrew means sorrow or misery or pain. His mother experienced great pain when he was delivered, and she named him pain so that he would never forget the pain that he had caused her. Children are given names for all kinds of reasons, you know. In a Reader's Digest story that I read, it says, it says in, in, in the 1960s, San Francisco, uh, the height Ashbury district, changed from being a, a hippie enclave to a high rent area. You know, a lot of people were, were coming over there. And many of the hippies moved down to the coast of uh, Santa Cruz. There they uh, got married and had children. Though not necessarily in that order. <laughs> but most of them, you know, didn't uh, give their children common names like Jane, Mary, Bill, Robert. No, no names like that. The hippies gave their children names like Time Warp or, or, or Spring Fever or, or Moonbeam, Earth and, uh, and Precious Promise, things like that. Now, when the kindergarten teachers met, Fruit stand, quote unquote, fruit stand. Every, you know, every fall for the first few days of school, parents were told to pin name tags onto their children's clothes, you know, kiss them goodbye and, and send them off to the school on a school bus. So it was for quote unquote fruit stand. The teachers thought the name on the name tag, you know, they saw it and they, uh, and they you know, the, it was rather odd. But they, they try to make the best out of it. So they'll tell him, you know, would you like to play with the blocks today, fruit stand? <laughs> and later, they, they, you know, they say, fruit stand, how about a snack? He accepted all of it, kind of hesitantly. But by the end of the day, 
his name uh, didn't seem much odder than, than some of the other kids. Well, at dismissal time, the teacher led the children out to the bus. And then she said, Fruchten, do you know which one is your bus? You know, which is on which one is your bus out? He didn't answer. You know, he was kind of, it, it wasn't strange because he, he hasn't answered them all day, you know, to, when they kept calling and talking. And lots of children are shy on the first day of school. It didn't matter. The teachers had instructed the parents to write the names of the children's bus stops on the reverse side of their tags. So the teacher simply turned over fruit stand's tag and there neatly printed was the word Anthony. <laughs> so his, his name was not fruit stand. Now, it would appear that James came from a dysfunctional family with a controlling mother who tried to lay guilt trips upon her children a, you know, and a father who is not even mentioned in, in, a, in, the, in the more than 500 names in the, in the genealogy list. All kinds of names mentioned, but Jabez's is father nowhere to be found. Jabez is mentioned, but not his father. So why is Jabez mentioned? It must have been because Jabez overcame the obstacles created by his upbringing. You know, his mom named him Pain, and his father nowhere to be found, you know, all kinds of bad stuff going on as he grew up. And you may have experienced things like that, you know, something that happens, something that you're carrying, some load that's, you know, on you that's saying, you know, this is the way I was, this is my upbringing, this is where I'm at, and that's the reason why I am the way I am. The Bible makes a point of saying that Jabez was an honorable man, more honorable than the rest of his family. What am I saying? No matter where you grow up, or whatever the circumstances of your life, with the help of the Lord, you can overcome that. And be more honorable than not just the rest of the people around you, even more than your family, even despite the circumstances of your life. You have no one to blame against it because of this or because of that. Even if you go to psychology, uh, psychological help, psychologists at the end of all of their trials and counseling and all that, will make you say, and I want to use that word make you say because you know, it takes time for them to just, for you to say it on your own, that you chose to be the way you are. <laughs> they won't let you say, well, it's because of this, you know, my dad did that one. They say, no, you, at the end of the day, you had a choice. And when we realize that we have a choice, like Jabez chose the most honorable yeah. path. Amen. And you can choose to be, you know, the most honorable, even this is despite the dysfunctional family that you've been surrounded with or, or, or from, you can choose to be honorable in your circumstances and more than every member of your family. Notice too that Jabez's name is buried in the, in the middle of, of nine chapters of genealogies. Now most of us would probably be so bored if we tell them to read uh, Chronicles as the name of me even suggests, by the time we reach his name, we would just read his name and keep on going. But Jabez is like a shining star in a long list of anonymous characters. And what Jabez is remembered for is not some outstanding achievement, but for a prayer that he prayed. You know, the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10, it says, if we want to uh, you know, God to answer our prayers. If we want God to say, you know, this is my child, and uh, and want God to be able to listen to our prayers, hear, hear what Jabez has to say. It says, and Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me, indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. That's Jabez's prayer. He's mm -hmm. praying. His prayer had four parts, and I'm going to tell you about each part. And hopefully, my oh, hope is you. to persuade you in your own personal prayer life that you will learn to pray in that sort of way. Maybe not a repetition of what Jabez was saying, but include those elements. Because the benefit that, that Jabez got 
from praying so honestly from his heart is amazing because in spite of all the things that he observes in his circumstances, in the circumstances of his life, dysfunction all over the field. I mean, his mom wouldn't let him get away with the fact that she, he caused her a lot of pain. And dad nowhere to be found. Even if he was a halfway decent man, his name would have been mentioned. But he wasn't. In his prayer, Jabez, number one, he prayed that God would bless him. Jabez, the Bible says, call on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me. That's the number one thing. He said, God, please bless me, God. He doesn't care about, you know, a lot of us don't pray to God that way. You know, we, have, we only come to God when we have a situation or a circumstance and, when, and, and that's beyond our control. That we can't just, you know, somehow rush here and there and make it happen. No. He comes straight to God and says, God, please bless me. Number two, he prayed that God would enlarge his territory. Number three, he prayed that God's hand would be with him. Number four, he prayed that God would keep him from evil. And in response to all of his requests, these four elements in, in his prayer, you know, the last part of verse 10 says, so God granted him what he requested. You see, prayer is so important. Oftentimes we just think about praying or think it's a good idea to pray. Amen. But we never really pray. And even when we do pray, we forget to ask God. You know, it's not like you know, you know, some people say, well, I don't want to ask God for all of that. Well, if you don't ask, then, then you're not getting it. It's because of your own self. If we want God to answer our prayers, then you know, consider well, the prayer of Jabez, how he's praying. You see, the first thing we noticed is that Jabez prayed for God to bless him. He wanted God's blessing upon his life. One man wrote, I used to think it was selfish to ask God to bless me. Then he said, then I realized that the word blessed means to give, to have God's favor upon your life. To be blessed means to have God's favor upon your life. It isn't selfish to ask for that. In fact, all Christians should be asking God to have favor upon their lives. There's nothing wrong with praying for God to bless you. If it is for the purpose of, of being a blessing to other people. Now, if you want to have more so that you can give more, be, you know, be a blessing for, for God and His kingdom, you know, then that is an acceptable prayer. You see, how many of you here want God's blessing upon your life? Say amen. Yeah. 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 Which simply means you want God's favor upon your life. Yeah. Yeah. If you want wisdom so that you can help other people, then pray for wisdom. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. You know, half the time we go around life saying, I don't know how that works. I don't know anything about this. I don't understand this. These people are difficult. The situation is difficult. I don't know how to, you know, maneuver through all of this. So much going on. Lacking wisdom. You have no idea. God says, ask me. Just like you heard Herb say, God engineered the, his life and his circumstances around so that he would meet the right person. The right person would be put there by God. And it, it's surprising that he could not have engineered all of those circumstances, all of those situations, all of those people at the right time to be there so that things would happen. I'm saying that to say our God is an amazing God and his favor is an Amen. important thing to have in our life. And you should be asking for it. God bless him. You see, that's what he said. If anybody lacks wisdom, he should ask God. And then it says, who gives generously to all without finding fault? And it will be given to him. God is not saying, you want wisdom, I'm going to give you a little bit. Because you can't have too much. God says, I'll give you generously. All kinds of ways to understand things. Also, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. God wants to bless his people, so it's not wrong for Jabez to ask to be blessed by God. And it's not wrong for you and me to ask God to bless us, because we're asking God to have, to, asking to have his favor upon our lives. If you want success, or want to be a leader, because you want to serve others with more talents and resources, then pray for those things in order that, that you may be a blessing. 
Because one of the things is we can say, well, I, I wanted a lot of things, and I had a lot of things, and I accumulated a lot of things. See, these lot of things are going to remain right here, and, and you go <coughs> with nothing. This lot of things, accumulation of a lot of things, just for the sake of accumulating it, doesn't do us any good. But to be a blessing in the kingdom of God, as God wants to use us, that makes a difference. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. And then he says, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. You see, Jabez wanted to share in the Abrahamic blessing. He knew his ancestor, Abraham, had a promise from God that God would bless him. God wants to bless us, but we must want the blessing for the right reasons. Let me put it this way. If you're not closer to God now than you were last year, then somehow you missed the blessing. You need to pray for God to bless you to bring some new fire into your soul. Say, or, or some new passion for God. Or a new zeal for serving Him. A new desire to have your life be a blessing to others. God has instituted so much. He said, you know, I, I can make these things happen. Come to me, pray, I will, I will bless you. Every time the apostles went out fishing and Jesus was around, there was always plenty that they caught. Even after the resurrection, the apostles went back to fishing. And when they went back to fishing, it says Peter and the apostles were in the boat. And they heard someone from the shore call to them. Hey guys, hey Peter, or whatever. It is. And they turned around. It was John, James, and Peter. They turned around to see who's calling. And John's, it's the book of John, so John writes, and John realizes who it was, and he tells Peter, hey, that's the Lord. Remember, he had already been crucified, and they just watched him a few times in the resurrection, and, and they went, instead of doing the kingdom work, they went back to fishing. They went back to saying, you know, let's, this is all we know, let's do that. Of course, they haven't caught much, or caught anything, mm -hmm. And Jesus calls after them. And Jesus calls after them, and Peter recognizes it. And the Bible says he put on John's cloak or cloak and jumps right into the water and comes to the shore. And when they and because of, when Jesus called after them, one of the things that Jesus says is, put your net on the right side of the water. That's a favorite uh, line that Jesus used. You know, the first time when, when he, he associated or called Peter to the ministry, that's what he says, Peter, you know, let's go fishing again. Peter said, I've been fishing all day, I haven't caught anything. But he said, I'm going to bless you today. And he blesses him by saying, put your head on the right side. Now that phrase, Peter understands. So when Jesus yells out to him, he says, put your head on the right side. Of course, they hear the familiarity. It takes a little while for them to click that, click that phrase in their mind. And sure enough, he put the net on the right side and they catch a lot of big fish. But they come to the shore. Peter, James, and John come to the shore and Jesus already had fish ready, all broiling and good to go. <laughs> you see, they didn't need all of that. God is just saying, I can bless you, buddy. You can't catch nothing. And the Bible makes it clear, you can do nothing by yourself. Yes. But with me, by me, you can do all things. With him, we can do all things, but without him, we can do nothing. And he makes it plain. These guys catch nothing again all night. They caught nothing, but they're out there fishing anyway. And Jesus says, put your net on the right side. <clears throat> you know, if you know if you're on a boat, right side, left side really doesn't matter because the boat's not that huge. And here it is. It's here. The water's floating. The net's probably drifting even to the left. But they listen to Jesus, and they put it on the right side, and they catch and Peter later mentions how many there are. There are 153 large fish. The net should have broken, but the net didn't break because the Lord made it so. Lord made it so that the net didn't break. Lord made it so that there'd be plenty of fish. The Lord made it so that they didn't need all the caught fish for them to eat fish that day. He had already broiled some fish for them. 
What am I saying? I'm saying God is willing and able and ready to bless His people. He understands your needs. We don't need the blessing for the sake of the blessing. We need the Lord and His favor upon our lives. As an honorable man, Jacob, he was not only thinking of himself, he was thinking about the welfare of others. That's how it's mentioned as how honorable he is. Jabez was asking to be used by God. Question is, are you living only for yourself? You know, sometimes we are that way. We think only about ourselves and, and, and God and, and, and every, every, every aspect of our lives. It, it's, it's selfish. We, we want to think that, oh, this, we, we accumulate this and we, this happens. And we are like Peter, James, and John. Fishing, fishing, fishing. And we catch nothing or nothing to really show for for all the effort. Maybe you have some fish. Some to show. But God is saying, now I'll show you how, how, how to do it the right way. Throw your net on the right side. Do it the right way. He might as well have said that. And then on top of that, he also provided them the fish already good to eat. You see, don't live just for yourself. You see, we need to be used of God, used by God, to be a blessing to us. How many ways can you think of that God could enlarge your territory? One of the things I'm praying about, even for my own children, is that God would bless them in order that they might be used by Him in this world. They ask, what are you praying for, Dad? I'm going to tell them that. I'm praying that they will have a passion for God and that He will give them the necessary tools to serve Him. I'm also praying that prayer for all of us here. I, I want us to be God's people, being used by Him, in a world that needs them desperately. I want us to live for more than ourselves, which is easy and comes by default. You know, the apostles were the same. Jesus lived with them for three years, ministering to them, teaching them all kinds of things. And when he was gone, boom, they went back to fishing. Life as usual. And after life as usual, they catch nothing as well. Again, it takes Jesus to bless them. Like, look, you catch nothing. Throw it on the right side. Do it the right way. And sure enough, the fish, the catch is great. That's why when Peter is called, Jesus says, Come, I'll make you fishes of men. That's more important. You see, I pray that our lives will be used in serving God by serving the needs of others. I want us to be a part of what God wants to do in this world. And what, what He hopes to accomplish with us. You see, in a time of great discouragement, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and He said this. In Isaiah chapter uh, 54, verse 2, it says, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. God is saying, make this happen. God wants us to see beyond our circumstances to what can be accomplished if we will join in seeking His blessing. Thirdly, Jabez prayed for God's hand to be on him. Jabez knew what he was praying for was bigger or way bigger than what he did accomplish by himself. And many of you have dreams and notions and ideas and, and wishes and, and you're thinking about things that are way out of your league or way out there. You're thinking there's no way I can accomplish that. And to tell the truth, yes, there's no way you can accomplish that. But with the help of God, God is saying, include me in that plan. And see what I can do. Yes. That's what Jabez prayed. For, for God's hand to be with him. He couldn't end it. There's no way Jabez could enlarge his territory. He comes from a very dysfunctional family. In every, every which way you can probably uh, tell yourself, you know, hey, from, from what I can perceive my circumstances, the way it is presented to me, there's no way for me to have dreams like that. Hopes like that. Wishes like that. But God is saying, pray to me. Jabez prayed that for God's hand to be with him. He was praying for something so big that only the hand of God on his life could accomplish it. Someone said, God answers prayers in four ways. Yes. No. Wait a while. And I've got this often. It's like, you've got to be kidding <laughs> yes, no, wait a while, you've got to be kidding. See, I, I think that there are times when I pray, 
God answers, you got to be kidding, James. And then he says, you think that'll work? Because I think the Holy Spirit do this and that and all things. They, you, know, you think that'll work? The end result, he says. God says, I can see the end results. And if we do that, it would defeat everything you're trying to do. So we have to follow God and his ways. And then he says, you know, our prayers should always include, not my will, but yours be done. As part of that prayer. I think we should all pray, Lord, let your hand be with me. Because when God's hand is upon us, we don't want to be afraid. You know, a lot of us are afraid of circumstances, afraid of trying, afraid of making things happen, afraid of, of make, putting in the effort because you think, like, if I do that, I don't know. There's no way that's going to succeed. God wants us to take, wants to take care of us. <laughs> Shouldn't we ask for his care? Instead of just thinking about it? You see, shouldn't we ask for his presence in our lives? Moses made that very clear when he talked to God. God said, I want you to free my people. And Moses is telling God, I'll do everything you want me to do, God. But I won't leave this place until you promise that your presence will go with me. You see, he understood leading a million people across the wilderness for 40 years. He's not ready for that. God prepared him. 40 years of preparation in, in Egypt and 40 years of preparation in the desert. He was ready, but still he didn't have the confidence. The Bible says he was the most humble man. You know, if you're humble before a million people, they try to rule your life. And he was a very humble man. And he knew he needed God's help. And he made that clear to God. He said, God, I'm not going anywhere until you say that your presence will go with you. And you can pray that prayer because you're afraid how things will turn out. If you make those goals, those aspirations, those, those ventures, if you even make an effort in that direction, you're afraid it'll be a waste of time, it'll be a waste of money, it'll be, a, you know, I, I won't be able to do the things I need to do, but there's no way I can accomplish all that and it's a waste of time trying. That's how Moses was. There's no way he's going to free a million people when he himself, you know, they, they chased him out of there or they he was wanted for murder and he would have been, you know, killed for that. He ran away. God is asking him to go back to that place, not just to confront the king or the pharaoh, but also to free all the people. The task was so huge. It's just unthinkable. <coughs> And the same way, the task that God has laid in your heart may be so huge and unthinkable that you might think like, you know, there's no way that I can even dream of coming close to accomplishing that. But God says, include me in. And God, Moses asked God for his presence to go with them. And 40 years of wilderness, God's presence went with them. They felt it. They knew it. They saw that the pillar of fire and the cloud they knew God's presence was And God's presence was with them throughout that journey. What am I saying? God wants to take care of us. We should ask for his care and his favor. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 37, verse 23 to 25, it says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be buried headlong. Because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Amen. I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Amen. You see, you, sh you need not be, uh, you know, when, when the apostles went fishing and again and again and again they catch nothing by themselves. It is discouraging to be called a fisherman at that point. I don't know why they can't call themselves. We are fishermen. We know what we're doing. You're really not catching any fish. You don't know what you're doing. But Jesus tells them. The point is, when Jesus says so, when he's put a burden on your heart, and you come in, the fish is already ready. You don't even have to catch anything for you to come and eat some fish. He says, it's already ready. They come in, they don't know what to say. And he prays with them. And he shares his prayer. You see, I believe... In the final part of Jairus' prayer is the most important Jairus' prayer. And, 
that God would keep him from all evil. I usually read the NIV translation. 